Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I guess we, we can start right now. Uh, so welcome to this uh, extraordinary session of uh, Vanbuck. Uh, for the first time, I think, going virtual. Uh, so uh, today we're going to proceed uh, with our regular uh, schedule for the seminar. So we're going to start by a 15-minute introductory talk uh, by Enda Erhan, uh, followed by a five-minute question and answer session. Uh, after that, uh, we're going to have our main speaker, Dr. Ibrahim Nomanovic, uh, if I'm pronouncing this correctly, uh, and followed by a Q&A session of 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, so the format for the question and answer sessions is that uh, please keep your question, uh, either use the raise hand function or uh, post a question on the chat uh, or post that you do have a question in the chat. And uh, one of the two Williams uh, are going to uh, ask you to uh, read uh, to ask your question or we're going to read the question on your behalf. And uh, with that, I would like to our speakers today. So first, we're going to have Emre Erhan. Uh, Emre uh, is a graduate student at Dr. Steve Jones's lab uh, at UBC, and he's going to be talking to us today about his work on support vector machines uh, predict metastatic cancer patient drug. And uh, our main uh, feature talk is by Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim is an assistant professor at the Department of Computer Science at the University of Victoria. And his title presentation is on how to build a high performance and, and user friendly language for data science. I would like to. Uh, I would like to thank our uh, sponsor, sponsor so Ecoscope uh, and uh, Bioinformatics uh, at UBC and SFU, uh, the BC CDC uh, Foundation for Public Health, and the Canadian Bioinformatics Workshops, Pacific Institute for Mathematical Sciences, uh, Genome BC, etc., and BC Cancer. Uh, and I would like also to thank our uh, technical uh, webcast support. Not for this time. We're not using uh, uh, this for, for our extraordinary session, but our regular sessions, Westgrid, Computer Canada, and PHSA uh, Telehealth. Uh, and of course, I would like to thank all the organizers listed here. And uh, please follow us on all of the different uh, social media accounts or on our website bug.org and these seminars are being uploaded regularly on our youtube channel uh, which you can check uh, so with that just a reminder that this event is being uh, and, uh, including this virtual event so with that i would like to give a small uh, introduction for uh, our introductory speaker, uh, Emre. So, can you get yourself, Emre? Yes. Okay. Hi. Uh, so, great, we can hear you clearly. So, uh, Emre, uh, Emre uh, completed his bachelor's uh, from Simon Fraser University in computing science and molecular biology and genetics. Uh, he is currently part of the bioinformatics program at UPC and is a master's student at Steve Jones's lab. Uh, and his current research is on the applications of machine learning methods for cancer genomics and precision medicine. So with that, uh, I would like to give the floor for Emre. All right. Can everyone see it? Yes. Great. Okay. I'll just get right into it. Uh, thanks for that introduction, Vara. Um, so yeah, this is the topic of my presentation today. It's uh, the bulk of my research for my master's thesis. Um, and sort of before I get into the research, I just wanted to talk about the motivating uh, reasons we care about this. So first about some metastatic cancers. So uh, cancer becomes metastatic when 
a piece of the original tumor moves sites, so-called from the primary site to a metastatic site. Uh, this is usually very bad for the prognosis of cancer. Uh, in fact, metastatic cancers are responsible for 90% of cancer-associated mortality. And it's very difficult to treat metastatic cancers, metastatic cancer patients. Usually, the goal of a metastatic cancer treatment is to prolong survival and maintain quality of life, so-called palliative uh, treatments. So that, that's why it's really important to be able to uh, figure out how to treat these cancers better. There's been a lot of work in applying machine learning for um, predicting responsive cancers. So most of this work has been in predicting risk cell lines. There's two examples of those papers here on the left. Um, and there's been one study, as far as I know, on applying this in, on actual human patient data. So that, that, that's, that's, what I've, that's also what I'm working on. This study, the one on the right here, was on um, treatment-naive tumors from NIH clinical trials. Uh, so these are not metastatic cancers, and their um, study size is very small. It's really hard to get good data from, good, good clinical data from uh, human patients, just there, there aren't that many, there's not that many data sets, especially for metastatic cancers. So the, the, the data that I'm working with comes from the Personal Cycle Genomics Program. Many of you have probably heard about this program. It's based out of the BC Cancer Agency. Uh, the main goal of this program is to determine sort of driving mutations and the reasons why metastatic cancers happen and ultimately to be able to figure out how to treat them. Uh, so I'm not working with some somatic mutation data. I was working with, I'm working with the transcriptomic data. I'll go into that in the next few slides, but this is where my data actually comes from, this PROC program. Uh, it's a very unique data set. We've got 570 metastatic cancer patients. There is transcriptome whole genome sequencing done on the metastatic tumors, uh, as well as whole genome sequencing done on liquid blood biopsies from these patients. Um, so that there's physician test response for a very small number of these patients. So in order to be able to determine which of these patients are actually doing well and which of them are doing poorly, uh, as well as a history of treatment. So before the biopsy happened and after the biopsy happened, which uh, cancer therapies were these patients on? One of the difficulties of this cohort is that it's very heterogeneous. So there's over 70 different drugs that these patients are on. They're often on a drug, on multiple drugs at the same time, and they change drugs very often, which makes it difficult to determine which drug they're actually responding to. As well as uh, there are many different kinds of cancers from which there are breast cancers, lung cancers, colorectal cancers, which are the, the three biggest cohorts. But um, it, it, it really just complicates things. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to associate the chance of profile of a tumor with its response to a drug. Before I go into that, I wanted to like, just give some background on what a tumor profile looks like, or what it looks like in this application in particular. So after aligning the reads from, so you do this rna experiment from the uh, tumor biopsy, and you align the reads to the human transcript of a reference, you count how many reads there are per transcript, and you normalize that by the length of a transcript because the longer a transcript is, the more reads are going to be heading it. And then you normalize that by the total number of reads in that ex particular experiment so you can compare it across multiple samples. Um, and then here's sort of the second part. The, the reason why we're interested in this is at, when we're looking at these graphs, so on, on the y-axis, we've got these on treatment, and on, we have BC cancer uh, protocols. So uh, therapy protocols for patients. It doesn't matter what these protocols actually are, but when you look at them, you see that there are some patients who are on a drug. I assume you can see my cursor here. You can, um, some patients are on a drug for a very long period of time, and then some patients are not on it for very long at all. And sort of our assumption is that if a patient is on a drug for a long period of time, they've either responded well, uh, oh, well, we're assuming that, they've that their doctor would have taken them off that drug, or vice versa, if they've on been for if they've been on for a short period of time, they haven't either they either haven't responded to the drug or they've had a poor response of a genomic response to that, to that therapy. And this is what we're trying to do. So we're looking at this in this hyperdimensional space of this trans transcriptomic space, and we're, we're asking the question: Is there a hyperplane that divides the, the poor responders from the good response? Uh, and th there's many other reasons support vector machines. You can use, use a lot of other methods, and I, I'm happy to discuss later if you have questions. Uh, so 
th this is our main response. This is our main goal, as I just said. Um, now, the, the first thing they did is I looked at for, for those patients who we have a uh, physician such response, does that associate with their days on treatment on that, on that particular drug that they were assessed for? So these are, we, we have around 130 patients who have taken gemcitabine. Uh, there's somewhere around 40 or 50 of those for which we have physician such response. Those three columns are the ones on the, are on the right here. So there's progressive disease, partial response, and stable disease are those um, categories. And you can see that patients that were assessed for progressive disease were on for a far shorter amount of time than those who had either a partial response or whose disease didn't change to a stable disease. Uh, so this is sort of motivating using these as, uh, as a proxy for response. It's important to be able to do this because we, having a cohort of 50 patients isn't going to tell us very much. We'd, we'd really like to be using the whole 130 patients for doing this kind of production. Um, uh, and then it's very difficult to be able to do predictions on the entire um, feature set. So when, when I'm talking about features here, we're talking about uh, the transcriptome profile, so the relative expression of genes um, in a patient, in a tumor. So the, the way that I reduced the dimensionality of this it was inspired from that NIH talked about earlier. Uh, it's a method called recursive feature elimination. It's an iterative process where you train a model on the entire on part of the data set, and then you validate it on a validation set. Uh, you look at which features or genes, in this case, were the least informative for making a prediction, and for S1, that's determined by uh, which genes have the smallest weights, smallest absolute value of weights. You remove some percentage of those, and then you train it again, and you do this over and over again you pick the model that has the highest validation score. You pick the, the feature set. Uh, and so I've done this for every therapy and cohort combination in the POC cohort. And we found that the gemcitabine cohort in particular, uh, this was a very, this was really well for us. So the, we're, we're talking about pan-cancer response. So um, this is across all cancer types. Perform best on breast cancer, but I've, I've left that slide out. We can talk about that later if anyone has any questions. Um, so graph here on the left, we've got days on treatment on the y-axis. Uh, my model, the model's prediction is the it, it is the colored dots. So we want to see the blue dots above the median line and the red dots below the median line. Uh, sorry, I should have clarified. This is a I, I'm looking at this as a binary classification problem. So given a patient is, is it, are they going to be in the uh, above the median of patient response or below the median of patient response uh, so that, that's what the color denotes it's the prediction of the svm um, so uh, as you can see the accuracy score and influence scores are pretty good and the rfe the recursive facial elimination has come down to around 3000 genes that seem to be most predictive for this task so now that we have these uh, genes, the set of genes that seem to be highly predictive for this, we can do a gene set enrichment. So to see if there are some ways that are coming up that uh, sort of give a biological, biological explanation for what the model is doing. Uh, the way that I've done this is sort of a naive approach. There's probably a better way to do this, but uh, I've taken the features from the support vector machine that have uh, so after you take the absolute value of all the weights, you rank them and then take the top 25 percentile of weights. And then, so we're, these are the weights that had the highest impact on the prediction. And then I've run these, a, a gene set enrichment over these genes over uh, Go, Keg, and Reactome. So here's some of those results, set enrichment. Uh, for all the databases, there seems to be this response to type 1 interferon that's coming up. Uh, type 1 interferons, these, so interferons are proteins that are expressed in a cell in response to a uh, viral infection. Uh, immediately, there doesn't seem to be any reason why a viral infection would be associated with um, cancer or drug response. But uh, after doing some digging, there does seem to be some papers that, uh, it, again, this, this is a little... Um, I'm sort of validating my own preconceptions here, but in any case, there does seem to be some papers that 
uh, back this up. So this one here, they find that interferons have some sort of synergistic anti-tumor properties with gemcitabine. Uh, and in another paper, they found that interferons promoted uh, apoptosis combined with gemcitabine. Um, right. So I think this, this is really what the interesting applications of this are. So I think being able to show that I can predict how a patient will do, or relatively how a patient might do to uh, to be in. We can now look at new patients that are coming into the POG program. So here, again, on the y-axis, we're looking at uh, time on treatment, but this is formed just so you can see where all the dots are lining up. And then on the x-axis, we're looking at all the different tumor groups. Um, and the, the dark dots, the darker dots are the, the new patients that are coming into the program. And then the older dot, the, the, the dots are those patients that have been on gemcitabine and taken off gemcitabine. So we know how, how well they've responded to this drug. Um, and we can compare how the new patients line up with old patients and say, hey, the, for example, this new breast cancer patient might act, might do well to gemcitabine. And, this would just be some motivation for a clinician to uh, prescribe GEM, or it could be any other drug. Um, yeah, so just like to, to help provide this database approach for uh, clinicians to be able to make um, therapy decisions for metastatic cancer patients. Um, so just some discussion here to wrap things up. Um, I, I think convinced at this point that this approach works, that there is some sort of signal, at least for a gemcitabine cohort, cohort, where I can say that I can predict how a patient is, will, will do uh, on gemcitabine. Uh, and perhaps I am finding some interesting biological explanation for how the model is working. I think there's still a little bit more digging to be done uh, for that one. And I think that this research provides a strong motivation for projects like the personal psychogenomics program. Uh, I think the more data we have, the better these predictions will get, and so better cancer treatments will get. Um, I, I think POG works is what I'm trying to say. Um, and yeah, just one limitation. Uh, note that this model is being able to predict the lower above or above or below the median. The so I, I've tried doing some regressions, sort of a progression course that doesn't work very well. And I, I think this is a matter of data. I think if I had more data, it, it would work much better. Um, right, and some future directions here. So I, I think I'll be able to do this same kind of analysis with other drugs that, that, that I have large uh, cohort sizes for. The paper I mentioned earlier, where they looked at NIH clinical trials, they found uh, good, res good um, they had good results with gemcitabine and 5 uh, fluorouracil so five a few might be another place for me to look. And I think in addition to this gene set enrichment analysis, it would be interesting to instead just look at the raw score of uh, the coefficients and do something there. I'm not quite sure how to go about that because there are so many genes, but um, it's, a, it's just another place for me to be looking at now. Just some acknowledgments here. Uh, on the left here is the picture of my lab mates. Um, this would be possible. And I'd like to acknowledge the graduate program in bioinformatics at UBC and SFU that, and NSERC for funding my studies. Uh, and there's, there's my email address there on the bottom if you have any questions for me. Thank you. Oh, I'll, should I stop sharing my screen? I'll stop sharing. Yes. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for the presentation. So if anybody has uh, questions, uh, you could uh, either raise your hand and with a raise hand feature, or you could post your question uh, directly in the chat, or you can say that you do have, <clears throat> that you do have a question in, in the chat. Um, I guess uh, while people think of questions, uh, I'll ask a question about, uh, uh, do you think that you can easily substitute uh, the, the, the binary, uh, prediction uh, problem that you have. So you're predicting if you're above the median or below the median, uh, can you substitute that for some other statistic? So you could say like, like you have a, like a hard number because you can imagine a situation if, like, if you keep on adding 
more patients and you do think that the, like that are that the median is the median actually may be a very good uh, reaction or to, to, to the drug. Uh, so can you change that for like another statistic just right. easily? Yeah. So, for example, about the 75th percentile or something. Uh, yeah, or, mis yeah. Or, or for example, like to say that uh, to have dr uh, drug response, like a survival of more than 300 days uh, to predict whether you're going to survive more than 300 days or not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I think the answer is yes. Um, I haven't done that, but I think you could do that. Yeah. So. One of the things that I, I, I've done is uh, it's not clear if patients who are on a drug for 300 days versus 150 days, if the 300 days actually did better than the 150 days, right? Like if most patients are around 25 to 40 days, it, it's a little iffy, you know? Mm -hmm. There's, there could be many reasons why a patient was on the drug for like, people who pass away on this program. There, there's, there's also all sorts of issues. Um, so one of the things I tried doing was giving more granularity to the, to the prediction. Mm -hmm. Trying to say, are you in the first 25th versus next versus next versus next? And that prediction didn't work so well. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So your, your SPM, uh, uh, like, I guess, like, how much can it tell you, like, uh, like a continuous value yeah. out of it? That doesn't seem to be working at this yeah, point, like, yeah. like right now. At this point, I'm not convinced that you can get a continuous value out of it, yeah. I, I've, I've, again, I've tried uh, just framing it completely as a regression problem and it doesn't work so well. So, yeah, I see. it doesn't work. Uh, does the audience have any questions? Uh, I guess I do have another question <laughs> uh, of, uh, so, do you think that uh, using uh, gene level, if you substitute that for transcript level, how different your results would be? How more challenging would it be if you use transcript level expression? Oh, I see. Um, hmm, I don't know. It's a good question. Well, I guess I should clarify. First of all, I'm I am looking at the transcript level. I, I like I'm I'm looking at uh, fifty thousand ensemble. Yeah, transcript mm -hmm. IDs. Uh, but I don't, I don't, when you're when you're coming down, you're looking at interpretation, right? Like I think that's what it comes down to. Uh, it's it's much more it's much easier to make interpretations at the gene level than it is to make interpretations at the transcript transcript level. But then, when you are selecting your three thousand genes as features, are these are these specific isoforms of these genes, or are they an aggregate for all of the isoforms of the gene? Um, so I guess these are isoforms, um, but I I'm not I'm asking like I'm not super interested in which iso right because. He, I guess my question is how how confident can I be that it's in fact that isoform that I'm looking at and not another one, mm -hmm. right? Because ultimately we're looking at short beads here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we do have one question. I'm going to read it out it's loud. So have you used other feature extraction approaches such as TSNI uh, or UMAP? Uh, so. Is the question have I used the uh, the latent factors for these um, from these methods? Is that what you're asking me, Texie? Uh, I'm not sure if they're typing. Well, okay, I'll, I'll answer that question. So, uh, no, I haven't, or I, I haven't use the latent vector from a PCA or TSNI or something to, to make these predictions. Uh, I think that it would work. It would make interpretation a lot, a lot more difficult. So oh, what does it say? Uh, use uh, 
So yeah, it's asking you use the SVM approach to do yeah. classification, but there are other ways to determine the best features uh, uh, to classify. Um, so I guess have you considered right. other? Right. So uh, uh, right, like I, I'm not. The, the, here's the thing. Like I, I don't think it's very interesting to marginally increase the the scores for these methods. I think it's more interesting to, at least at this point, at, at this research level, to be able to determine which genes are important in making these predictions. Um, you want to like really get an understanding of what the models actually do, right? So when, when you're using the latent vector of one of these methods, uh, it, it's not informative to, to know which of the latent features are make, important to making a prediction, which ones aren't. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so I think uh, we're approaching the end of the time for the Q&A session. So thank you so much, Andre, for your talk. And uh, I'm going to give the floor now to Faraz Hutch to introduce our main speaker, Dr. Brahim. So with that, please go ahead, Faraz. Thanks, Farah. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Ibrahim Nomanajek. Um, Dr. Nomanajek is an assistant professor in the Department of Computing Science in University of Victoria. He's also a Canadian Research Chair in Computational Biology uh, there as well. Uh, prior to uh, joining University of Victoria, uh, he was uh, a postdoctoral fellow in MIT, which he worked on a number of interesting problems um, uh, uh, from aligning the uh, text reads and also this um, today's topic that he's going to be that he's going to be talking about is uh, initiated when he was in MIT. Uh, prior to that, he was basically a veneer fellow and a PhD student in computing science in Simon Fraser University, um, and he is one of the pioneers in uh, sequence compression, uh, both uh, raw reads as well as the um, process reads. Um, uh, so he has received a lot of awards, and but uh, some of like a uh, uh, more notable one, he was also a recipient of the bronze medal in Balkan Olympiads for informatics. And by this, I'm just going to leave the floor for him to uh, dive into uh, his talk. And uh, Ibrahim, um, it's all yours. Hello, can you hear me? You do. Yes. Yes. Okay, awesome. And I guess you can see my slides. Is that also correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation to give a talk to, for Wembag. I'm sorry I'm not able to make it this time to Vancouver. Even if I made it, I guess we wouldn't be having the real, how would you call, um, in-person talk. So let's try to make it up this way. Um, thanks a lot for all, to all of you for joining. And today, basically, I'm going to be talking uh, how to build the programming language for bioinformatics and data science. So this is a joint work between uh, UX uh, Xerox TCG lab and MIT compiler group and MIT computational biology group. This is the, basically the work I started as a postdoc and currently carrying it on uh, currently in uh, Victoria as well. Um, so let's start with kind of standard stuff. We, today I know that data is everywhere and the term big data is used where it should and where it sh shouldn't be used, to be honest. And uh, why is that? Because we have um, lots of recent advances in technology and all kinds of measuring devices. So, you know, we can track everything on internet, attaching some device, and all of these things basically generate lots of data and we have to kind of analyze this data. And Regardless of your field, if you're in bioinformatics, SVR, or genomics, or even if you're in geography, astronomy, uh, psychology, you have a lots of this unstructured data you're trying to figure out how to analyze. Now, the poster child for the big data uh, and the issues with the big data is actually DNA sequencing. So I guess I don't have to spend too much time explaining the details of DNA sequencing to the people in this, how do you call it, uh, in this audience. Uh, but uh, roughly for people who, for some reason, never heard before what the sequencing is, where you actually read DNA from a sample, being human sample, animal sample, or just, I don't know, some you uh, took from under some rock. Uh, mechanical, you basically put it to sequencer, a machine, which will basically generate you a bunch of strings, RNA and DNA strings, which you after that have to analyze. 
computationally. Now, as again, all of you probably know, we have these things called next generation sequencing uh, machines. So this has been like a relatively recent. It's already been like, I think 20 years since, since the big breakthrough. So basically these are the technologies that allow fast and cheap DNA sequencing. So I think today we can sequence the whole human genome uh, in a less than hundred dollars. For a reference, 20 years ago, when, uh, when the first draft of human genome was released, they needed a couple of billion dollars to actually sequence the human genome. And the most interesting thing is that the development of sequencing technologies and advances in sequencing technologies are actually uh, uh, accelerating faster than a Moore's law, which is already exponential law itself in terms of computational performance. However, while the sequencing has been uh, accelerating and improving faster than a Moore's law, Computers did not. Uh, it's kind of common meme already in a system setting that the more load has been dead for some time. We are not getting as a, as impressive uh, improvements in a processor power as we used to do before. So today what has as a result is that the biggest bottleneck in sequencing pipeline is not anyway the price of reagent or how do you call the time you need to set up your agent and do the chemistry, but actually the computational data analysis. As you can see on this plot, uh, in 2010, computational data analysis was already taking how do you call it, 50% of the sequencing pipeline. Today, it's, I would say, even higher than this approximation from uh, like five, six years ago. So what are the reasons for this? First reason is the enormous scale of data. So not only these technologies have uh, improved uh, exponentially in the last two decades, but also the amount of data they have produced has been increasing exponentially in the last two decades. As you can see in this plot, which is again a little bit aged, like five years ago, uh, the, we are having the exponential increase in gigabases output per week. Um, this is by the log scale, so that's why it doesn't look as exponential as you would expect. But today, a single sequencing experiment for human genome can roughly, how do you call generate a half terabyte of data. So it's quite a lot of data, especially if you're trying to sequence, I don't know, the cohort of patients or something like that. Another problem we are having is that we are having quite a lot of uh, technology changes in the last 20 years. So there are quite a lot of platforms out there, uh, big platforms which most people are using, PegBio, uh, IonTorrent, uh, Nanopore, and different kinds of Illumina. So while the data these platforms generate is kind of superficially similar, each platform has its own quirk. Uh, and you have kind of to specially support a particular platform to be able to do your analysis. And there's also another basically this reason is that you're currently having a huge issue with practice skills. So with, how would you explain this in a more detail? Currently, I guess most of you guys here in the audience are actually the develop write scripts or tools in a, uh, for fix or how do you call for some genomics system. Two kinds of developers, depending on the language you're using. Uh, there are people who like to use accessible languages, such as Python, such as Python and R. But these languages are popular, they're easy to develop, and they're really easy to understand. And it's really easy to pr quickly prototype how you call uh, your ideas and to quickly put them to production. And it's also easy to maintain because code is very high level, so a person after you can easily pick up what, uh, what you have left for them and kind of improve it and so on. The problem with these languages is that they're too slow. In practice, even on a smaller data set, you need to wait to get results. But if you want to feed them half terabytes of data or something like that, they will just blow up. It won't execute. It's way too slow. As an alternative, you have a fast languages, as a C and C++. They're really fast. They basically have zero overhead whatsoever, runtime overhead, memory overhead. You have full control on your machine. However, they're really hard to write, hard to debug, hard to maintain. And uh, not that many people are actually super familiar with them because it takes quite long uh, and uh, that's one of the reasons that none of these uh, development practices we're having currently are actually optimized for bioinformatics for the sheer amount of data we have, uh, nor for the particular use cases we want to have in our field. Now, 
is there anything on there which can kind of help us with? There are a couple of libraries here and there, <laughs> but uh, there's no language that can fix pipelines. So the problem with libraries, while they can be really a lifesaver and can help you quite a lot in new tasks, they're still limited by underlying language. So if you're using Python, have a wonderful libraries like uh, by Python, uh, in R you have R conductor or something like that. But uh, in these libraries are, is eventually, is at the end of the day run by the same um, runtime that runs the language itself. So it's either low, or if you want to spread, you have to actually implement the hard parts in C and then basically put, uh, export the bindings to the language you're using like Python or R, which basically just makes the whole problem of C even worse because exporting bindings is not the easiest process ever. <laughs> Another pro problem with libraries is that we are having so many of these technology and you know, who knows, maybe tomorrow we'll have another technology which will make all the things we have been working so far obsolete. So they have to be constantly updated and so on and so forth. And this last problem is the uh, Libraries are also limited by the expressive, by the ex support pipelines, or doesn't support some really cool features which you might use in bioinformatics uh, development or which, which will help you to express your idea. Uh, if the language doesn't support it, library won't be able to support it. So you still how do you kind of do it the hard way? So to give you an example, how the pipeline looks like, currently in the bioinformatics. I'm going to give you an example from uh, many, many uh, from Tanex Genomics, how one of their officially released pipelines for analyzing their data look like. So they're using some domain-specific languages written in Bash. It's some hack on top of Bash. And this kind of description of every job is calling a Python processor, another kind of sort of domain-specific language, which does lots of processing. Now the Python itself keeps calling some components written in Go, some components written in Rust, some components written in Perl and C++ and so on and so forth. So very simple pipeline, which is just supposed to read DNA, correct the DNA reads, split them to run MapReduce and run on every single splitted component aligning, mapping procedure and then collecting results back. Is implemented in five, six different languages. Each of these languages, uh, for each of these languages, developers had to actually re-implement the same, um, same uh, core constructs from bioinformatics, like a, st a special type for a read, for a sequence, for ACGT, and so on and so forth. And it's really slow. So it takes days and days on cluster to actually align something from the next genomics, whole genome, by using this iPad. Question is, can we make it better? And this is, by the way, this is uh, the previous pipeline is not written by some grad student who was you know, rushing, trying to submit it for a deadline. He doesn't have a plan to support it anymore. In that case is perfectly understandable. That previous pipeline was actually written by a, a corporation which actually makes money on their products. So if that's the state of our question is, can we make it better? Is it, is it possible to make the development of informatics tools more enjoyable than it is right now? So to answer this question, I first need to give you a quick primer about genomics. Again, these are slides I have repurposed them from previous talks. I guess many of you know what's going on here, but it's not a bad idea to rehearse it again. So as you all know, uh, computational genomics applications use the same set of core operations. We mostly spend most of our time doing the string manipulation on a Olympian alphabet. We usually have four or five characters and we do a bunch of string manipulations, reversing, uh, copying, pasting, or something like that. Then we do lots of uh, queries, like we have a gigantic indices like whole genome indices, uh, the brain graphs, you name it, and we do lots of querying on these indices. And we also run a lots of dynamic al programming algorithms such as string alignment, all kinds of variations of string alignment, and so on and so forth. So these are kind of the bread and butter of the computational genomics. So the most quintessential example would be the alignment, short read alignment procedure, where you're trying to find uh, where from the donor genome a short read came from. So how this procedure roughly looks like <laughs> is that you would first, how do you call create an index out of donor genome, where you would basically uh, find uh, index uh, KMERS in the donor genome and make a gigantic index to find which KMER corresponds to each location. Then you would, how do you call split the read itself into the small KMERS, and then you would check the index 
find all occurrences of pH gamer in the reference genome. And then once you find the possible hits, you would find the most likely hits in the genome and then run the full dynamic programming algorithm to produce the final alignment. So this whole procedure is for one read. In practice, we have to repeat this procedure for tens or billions of reads. So obviously, it takes quite a lot of time to do this. Another, how do you call a good example is actually read assembly, where if in case you don't have a donor genome, your goal is to reconstruct the reference genome. So in that case, you would also how do you call extra caimans from reads, and then we cre create something called the brain graphs, and you will basically try to construct the to find the Eulerian walk in the brain graph, and that would be roughly your assembly. Now, the problem is NP-hard because our genomes have repeats, but uh, even if you want to solve it, with either with some heuristics or anything like that, you still have to construct this gigantic de Bruijn graph. Uh, and uh, making this graph from, again, from hundreds of millions of reads is really how you call both memory and CPU intensive task. So suppose that we want to develop a program which, which can kind of solve these problems. Our ideal programming language should kind of support two modes of development. First one should be top down or high level. You want to kind of be able to express the pipeline you came up with on a whiteboard very easily and elegantly in a source code. For example, if you want to do alignment, you would like just to take how you call a, to express your alignment pipeline, like as it's shown in the slide, you want to parse sequence, pass the results to camerize, then pass to hashing, pass to looking up, and pass to dynamic fragment. So ideally, user would just have to worry about these kind of high-level boxes and wouldn't have to worry about uh, uh, how do you call nasty details, how to efficiently implement these things. And this is, for example, one of the, one of the areas where Python shines on because Python uh, has a gigantic library and you can just sit down quickly, how do you call, just tag them on top of each other as shown here and quickly end up with the working code. You don't have to waste 10, 20 days like you would do in C just to implement something work workable. However, on the other hand, if you want to be able to optimize whatever is going on, you want still to provide end users, expert end users, uh, an ability to create these boxes low level very efficiently, as efficient as is possible with the, as much as possible of compiler as possible as much as possible help of, from the side of compiler. For example, you want to implement dynamic programming alignment, which would be the, the needle, Mamun, Smith, Waterman, or whatever you think. You should be, again, able to implement it uh, without being um, limited by the runtime or underlying uh, language itself. <laughs> the first idea, in case you, have, you are familiar with domain-specific languages, is like, why don't you create a domain-specific language? Can we just create a like, special domain-specific language for bioinformatics? And they have been a couple of really good examples, like Halite. Uh, it's another language for image processing from MIT. And that language was highly popular. It's currently used in Photoshop, uh, implemented, I think, in Snapdragon processors, uh, Google, like all companies use it. And that basically language is designed that you give it, how do you call uh, some image, image uh, um, improving uh, problem. You want to do some transformations on the images. You code it in that language, and it will, how do you call, come up with a smart schedule and a really, really, really fast code. And it really excels in that particular area. So the question is, can we do something similar like that in bioinformatics? We spent some time trying to do this. However, our conclusion was we cannot really have something like that. While the data and computational biology has general laws, uh, uh, like you know, there's short strings, we do lots of string manipulation, alphabet is limited, so on and so forth, the target computational domain is too general. For example, for image processing, computational domain is not. Um, is not too general. At the end of the day, you end up with the matrices and how do you could do some transformation on the matrices. I'm simplifying it a little bit, but their domain is quite restricted. In our case, we are using virtually any algorithm or data structure, whatever works or gets us how do you call good results, we're gonna use it. Uh, as a case uh, study, I'm gonna, uh, like uh, one of the projects I have been working before was uh, Alana for third generation barcode sequencing technologies for 10x genomics data. So for Emma, we had to deal with large file processing. We have to you know, load files, split them, sort them, do a bunch of stuff and correction on the reason, something like that. Then we had how do you call to implement a bunch of string uh, alignment methods, dynamic programming, also lots of uh, string pattern matching methods to be able to kind of implement the alignment core. Then alignment 
also depend on probabilistic methods like expectation max maximization, simulated annealing, and you also toyed at some time with integer linear programming. So as you can see, we kind of used half of computer science uh, just to kind of implement a, a simple mapper. So there is, the domain is way too general and you cannot have really restricted programming language. So what then do we need if we can have a DSL? So what we would like to have is we want to have a nice bioinformatics contract, like fast pipelining, efficient genomics contracts, and how do you call, we want our language to be really use, easy to use. However, we need the full power of general programming languages because uh, we want to be able to implement any algorithm out there, and we want it to be how do you call fast and efficient. And finally, we want it to be easy to use and learn. This is maybe one of the most important, uh, how do you call, uh, most important priorities for us currently. So another problem if you're trying to create new language, even if it's DSL, even if it's DSL or general programming language, is that uh, common complaint is like, oh, why do we need one more language, one more syntax to learn, one more set of curves to learn? It's really hard. And I kind of agree with that myself. I, I would be really hard, hardly persuaded to start using another programming language right now. So in order to solve this thing, and as you can see, we're using quite a lot of languages currently already in the how do you call, in the community, we're using uh, Python and R are really popular, CPP, but people are using Java, people are using PHP, people are using how do you call, bash scripts, bunch of stuff. So what we decided here, instead of trying to reinvent the wheel, let's just take the most popular language out there and copy it. And we decided to take Python and shamelessly copy its syntax and its logic completely. One of the reasons we went with Python is that we personally consider Python to be a really nice and expressive language. Unlike languages like R or CPP, it doesn't have a lots, of, uh, lots of baggage from the past uh, and it's uh, very easy for beginners to pick up and most of the people in the field already have a, are quite familiar with the language itself. So our goal was roughly the following. In terms of programming language researchers, we wanted to have a Python-like language or Python that actually does the state the static typing uh, of a high level dynamic language that Python is. Uh, we want the language to be able to express any algorithm, to be as general as possible, and also to support like uh, constructs like pipelines and pattern matching, which we find to be very useful in the developing of bioinformatics tools. And we also want to, um, our language to support all these uh, cool features from Python like uh, coroutines, generators, pipelines, and so on and so forth, and add some extra things like low-level system things like, let's say, memory prefetching, uh, efficient generators, and something like that. On the other hand, <coughs> our goal was also, <laughs> if you're trying to design a language, you want to understand what are the core set of operations and types in, in the domain you want to design a language for. For example, informatics, what are the core sets of operators and what are the core types in genomics. We want to, once you know these core types, you're able to optimize them and you're able to instruct compiler how to efficiently optimize them. And finally, we would also like to use our language in a practice. We don't want it to be a research language. We want to implement a bunch of existing tools in our language to see, does it work? Is it possible to implement them very easily, to maintain them easily and so on and so forth. So essentially what we are trying to do, we want to have something like a crystal for Python. If you, uh, crystal is some sort of, uh, of statically typed Ruby. And on the other hand, we also want to have something like MATLAB for bioinformatics. So essentially, if you think about MATLAB, MATLAB is also a general purpose language. You can do anything in MATLAB. You can create a web, web server in MATLAB. I wouldn't recommend, but you can. However, MATLAB is really, really good with, uh, with numerical computing and with the matrix manipulation. So that is the part where it excels. So that was our goal, how to call. We want a language to be general enough, so you can, again, make a web server if you want, but it really excels when it comes to genomics data and bioinformatics pipelines. And one of the main things we wanted, uh, one our like guiding principles <laughs> was that a user should only worry about the problem at hand, not about the optimizations. All optimizations, regardless how big is your data, 50 mega, megabytes or five terabytes, those decisions should be, how do you call, decided by the compiler itself. You should be just able to take your idea from the whiteboard and directly implement it in your language, in our language, and that's about it. So as a result, we came up with a language which we call Seek, 
it's kind of language for computational biology. So we kind of try to marry together the ease of Python, performance on C, and to add extra genomics features. So it's a general language which has lots of with a host of genomic related features and optimizations. Again, I would like to think of Seek as a MATLAB for bioinformatics. So here's a quick primer how the source code looks like. And I'll keep going uh, on and forth and giving you some examples. So uh, top level, syntax is virtually identical to Python. And it has been, Seek has been designed in a way that you can actually copy paste most of your current Python scripts. I would say 80, 90% of existing Python scripts, you can just copy paste on top of language, and there you go. It will just work, no questions asked. And if we added anything new, we added it on top of Python how you, on top of the Python syntax. So existing Python should be some sort of subset of the Seek. So for example, in this slide, can see some extra features we added. We added like a uh, pipelining, so you can just support something. If you ever used in R, migrator, like that piping operator, we have the same thing in seek. Uh, we have some special operation like a reverse complementing, and you can have some highly optimized KMR types. We also support pattern matching. I'm gonna be talking about that later and so on. <laughs> Question is, how, do you, how, how is this made to work? Like, why does it work? So Python, as you all know, is duct typed dynamic language that does everything at the runtime. It has no compiler in a traditional sense of the word, so everything is decided at the runtime. And uh, this decision by the Python authors is actually what gave the Python such a power and such a, such a ubiquitousness. So today, Python is everywhere here. People are building web servers with Python, people are using it in data science, in computational biology, in astronomy. Virtually any field of computer science people are using, and they really like Python, because it's an ext extremely malleable language, and it, you can make it to do anything. However, it's dynamism, which is also one of its main strengths. It's also its main weakness. The reason why Python is slow is not because the people who made Python didn't know what they are doing. They are actually highly accomplished computer scientists. But simply, if you want your language to be as malleable as Python is, you have to sacrifice the speed. It's not possible to do it otherwise. So what we want, we want the syntax and clarity of Python with none of the runtime overhead that it has, this dynamism. So our solution was strongly typed language with Python syntax that does everything at the compile time. So our goal was basically, if you think about it as a research problem, our goal, our question was how much of this dynamism we can actually move it to compile side and compile it in advance so that we don't have to worry about it in runtime and to make it as fast as possible. So here's an example, for example. You suppose that you just want to create a single float variable. So if you do it in Python, reference the Python implementation, which is the most common implementation out there, this number, 3.14, and variable x, Python runtime has to maintain these two gigantic structures. These structures show stuff like, I don't know, um, what is the previous object, next object, what is the GC status, uh, what is the parent object, um, and it, just one of these items in the structure is actually the value itself of the double. So for this very simple 8-bit, how do you call it, 8-bit double, Python has to, how do you call maintain a, I would say at least 50, 60 bits at every single time and has to kind of keep track of these things. So obviously it takes much longer to process this double. On the other hand, in Seek, if you do this thing, Seek will automatically figure out the type and just store directly this float in one register, as C would do. So simple eight bits, no overhead as in Python whatsoever, which obviously makes it much faster. <laughs> now, when you say strongly type, people are usually get a bit uh, afraid. I, myself, in the beginning was both afraid of strong types and a bit annoyed by them because most people have bad experience from C++ when it comes to strongly typed languages. You know, you have to write all the time, especially in versions of C++, you have to write, you know, vector of int of strings, whatever, iterator equals. You have to every time specify it manually and specify it in 50 places. It's like very inconvenient if you're trying to quickly design something. In Python, on the other hand, you don't have to worry about this thing. You just, you know, write a variable, you don't specify type, Python will figure it out for you. But how do we kind of get these things two together? Well, for example, suppose that you have this particular function, f of x, which is calculating 3x three, three plus 1. In Seek, Seek will basically consider this function to be a generic function. 
So C compiler will see this function, which will it accept as is, as a generic. Think of it as a template in C++, where the X can be any type. And every time we pass different type to this function, like integer or float or string, C will generate a special version of this function for that particular type. Again, this is all happening under the hood. The user just uses the first box here. The rest is handled by compiler. Compiler is able to generate the functions for each type, optimize it for each type, and how would you call, uh, handle any issues. And one of the benefits of this is, unlike in Python, where it sometimes happens that you're running your script for three days, and after three days it fails because the type error you passed the wrong type uh, to a function which doesn't accept it. Uh, in C, you know all of these problems beforehand because compiler has to how do you call run the type checking before compiling itself so this whole concept of generics can be extended to the classes so you can also generate uh, make a classes with the generic types and you can have also like a more fancier functions with the with the more finely grained uh, how do you call type logic for example you can just try this item function as just def item and f that's about it you don't have to specify return types or whatsoever, we can figure it out for you. But if you want to have some more, um, how would you call restrictive rules, like, you know, this ha function has to be, uh, has the return type as the first node or something like that, then you can kind of manually uh, model it as you wish. And we're currently also working on a version where you would, wouldn't have to kind of include types at all, uh, which is based on Hindley Milner uh, type, uh, how would you call it, deduction scheme. One more thing which I want to mention is that uh, one of the reasons why Python is popular is not only because language is nice, and it is, but also because it has a gigantic standard library. And uh, also not only gigantic, but, but very well designed. So there have been also before many attempts to actually make Python faster. But in most cases, people were kind of beaten by this fact that Python ha has a, such a huge library. So they decided to make Python faster on top of Python itself to improve the runtime, to make it faster here and there, but still keeping the runtime itself. In our case, we decided to get rid of runtime altogether, which means that everything that's going on in Python's final library, we had to re-implement it ourselves. And we re-implemented everything in Seek itself. So the language is already powerful enough that you can implement all these constructs in the language itself. For example, the classes for lists, all these like utilities from Python, these, these are all the how do you call uh, excerpts of the C code we use internally actually to run the whatever is needed to be done. Now, obviously, we are having some differences with Python because uh, we sacrifice some things to be able to gain the speed. Uh, so, our main goal here was. Um, we are going to sacrifice the things which are not used in the bioinformatics community. So for example, uh, dynamic monkey patching of methods. This thing is actually quite useful if you are um, developing a web server again. But in bioinformatics, no one uses it. And this particular feature is actually, if you remove it, you, you are able to speed up stuff quite a lot. So we just decided to de remove everything which is never used in our field, in uh, data science, in general, in scientific applications and focus on the rest and see what can we get out of it. So the, currently the differences with Python are, I mean, the most important one is the functions can only return objects of a single type. You know, in Python, you know, function can sometimes return integer, sometimes string. In our case, it, the return type has to be fixed. <laughs> we also do not support collections that get uh, with them out different types. For example, you cannot have like in Python, a list with the string and integer at the same time, list has, has to be a either integers or of strings. We do not support dynamic monkey patching. So you can change the methods of object at the compile time, but not during the runtime. We currently do not support inheritance nor polymorphism. We have some other ways to alleviate this, and, uh, but you're actually working to add this thing on. And we have a little bit stricter scoping rule than in Python. And we skipped a couple of features like four L's and lambdas, but the, most of these uh, things I listed here, except maybe for the function that can only return as object of a single types, are implementation details. So they're not here because there are some technical issues. It's simply we didn't have enough time. It's two person's projects currently. So we, are, we were trying to prioritize some other things, but we're actively working to kind of close the gap between C and Python. Another 
very important thing I would say, especially in the field of informatics, are coroutines and generators. So generators are extremely important, although not that commonly thought of feature in Python. So for example, if you do in Python for a in range tree, like for loop, actually Python does create a generator, like a lazy generator, which will keep feeding your for loop, how would you call it, zero, one, two. So what's good about generators, uh, they're basically, uh, in Python, that's another way to say how you call coroutines. Uh, you can think of coroutines as a lazy function. So the way that Python supports laziness. So instead of, for example, having to load a terabyte of data, then passing it to other how do you call the other part of the pipeline, the other part of the pipeline, so on and so forth, or doing some hacks to speed it up. If you have a lazy functions, it can just, you can think of it as a streaming channel. It just takes the first item from the, let's say, one terabyte of, of uh, items you're having around. It just takes the first out item, pass, processes, passes to the next item in a pipeline, then it takes the second item and so on and so forth. It's much more memory efficient. It's actually very easy to visualize. The problem with curtains and generators, why many languages don't have support for them, is that uh, it's not easy thing to implement them. Uh, you have to actually implement the schedulers, you have to be able to suspend the coroutines to bring them back and so on and so forth. <laughs> However, our underlying uh, compiler framework, which are using LLVM, does actually support coroutines. So we were actually able to implement full Python generators with virtually no overhead thanks to the special optimization passes by LLVM. And I would say that we are probably one of the heaviest users of uh, coroutines uh, from LLVM of all languages out there on the market. So as an example, in C++, you have a simple for loop for i equals zero to three. It will get translated to this, how do you call assembly code. Seek would use coroutines, so you would first get translated to this assembly code, but then after running a couple of optimization passes, it will end up the same thing. So you will have the full power of the coroutines and ability to stack them together, to pipe them together, laziness and everything, but compiler will take care to optimize them as, as if, if it was C, if, if that was the case. And I also just want to quickly walk through with you <laughs> through new features of the language itself. So these are the features on top of Python and uh, that we have in Seek. <laughs> First one is the pipelines. So as I said, instead of writing F of cameras of DNA, you can just take the DNA, then pipe it to camerization procedure, then pipe it to the function which does some processing. <laughs> the cool thing about this, is that you also support parallel pipes. So if you just add an extra character, you will get this, how do you call step parallelized for free. And it also works if you have nested parallelization. So you can actually have four or five levels of parallelization and Seek is smart enough actually to have a, a thread scheduler, which will automatically schedule them to execute as fast as possible. So basically if you just add one extra character in your code, you will get parallelism for free without worrying about anything. Another thing are the special genomics types. So we have a special sequence types, which, which are like strings, but have a prefix S. And we also have a special camera types. And we've done lots of compile time optimizations. We, for example, store them as a two-bit sequence encoding. We have a lots of internal lookup tables. For example, we want to do reverse complementation. This is like nearly instantaneous procedure because we rely on some uh, processor intrinsics and uh, lookup tables to make it like instantaneous. And another thing which we are really, how do you call, spend lots of time he spends lots of time on this is to avoid any unnecessary copying of the strings and data. So very often if you're using uh, Python, if you are assigning a string to another variable, it might be copied or in C the similar thing happens. Now in C you can avoid it by how do you call using pointers of the references and it's actually a very common thing you have to do in your C++ by informatics code because how do you call every single copy costs quite a lot. While the copy itself of 100 character costs nothing. If you have to repeat the same copy for 100 millions of reads, it actually, it can actually end up how do you call making your software slower for one hour. And uh, fixing these things in C++, while it's doable, it's very painful and it's easy to make bugs. So in our case, we do some analysis of what's going on in the code. And we plan actually to improve this even better. But currently we do analysis and see as long as there is no need to copy anything, we won't copy it. So even if you take a string and take a slice of it from position three to five, if you know that you're not gonna uh, 
modify that how you call particular slice later there's no need for us to copy that thing you can just keep a pointer to original string and it's all kind of hidden from the user so you can just kind of write your code as is you get the full speed and if you ever need to do copying compiler is smart enough how you call to a hat figure it out for you you also have something like pattern matching so if you ever use the ocaml rust or these modern languages so you can basically uh match it like match variables like uh Think of it as a, some fancy version of switch case if you're kind of C++ background. For example, you can match n if it's a negative, if it's zero, less than 10 or something like that. Where matching really gets powerful is if you kind of plug it together with uh, sequences. For example, you can match for the spaced cameras very easily. Just take a sequence and match it against spaced cameras. The spaces are here with underscores. <laughs> or you can also use them this special match construct from SIG to actually check is it on reverse complement or something like that. So there are like lots of these things you can, uh, these genomic matchings you can use to quickly find the GC rich region to find uh, does your read have a spaced scammer or something like that. Another thing, uh, we want people, we don't want you to rewrite everything in SIG. It's, uh, in, you know, it's quite unreasonable to expect people, here we have new language but you have to rewrite everything there. So what we ended up with that you can virtually call any C or Python code directly from Seek and you also plan to support cloning R from Seek. So essentially what we want you to do, you take Seek does the heavy lifting and then you already have some in, something implemented in Python and you have some cool statistical how you call functions on an R, you just call it directly from the Seek. Uh, and how you kind of get best of the board plots. For example, if you want to get the functions from C, you just say C def of name of function, and that's it. C does the rest. Same for Python. You can, how you call import? We have something called pyamp import. So it's very similar to import from uh, Python. So basically, if you have a Python module like mymodule.pi, you can just implement any function and call it directly in Python. Or you can directly type even the Python code directly in C with pydef. So pydef functions will get executed by the Python runtime. So in this way, you can kind of seamlessly interact between Python and C back and forth. <laughs> you also support, if you have a classes or types, we can extend them at the compile time with extend uh, statement. So suppose someone creates a library Perfect, but you need one more item or one more thing. How would you, or you even need to extend the native types like int with some special functions. Go ahead, seek support it. As I said, it doesn't support you doing that at the runtime, but at the compile time, we perfectly support it. And because we are, how would you call, completely ripped off Python when it comes to the uh, operator overloading and conventions and stuff, you can also overload operators like here. You can overload the multiplication of integer by doing something like this. And the final thing I'm gonna talk, new feature, is prefetching. <laughs> so let me give you a quick overview what prefetching is about. Today in most genomics tools, more than 50% of the time is wasted on styling, waiting for memory. So this has been a recent study. They study BWA, Bowtie, SNAP, FSBA. And by the way, these are all like, uh, you know, mappers uh, written in C, highly optimized, supported by gigantic either corporations or gigantic research centers, like lots of people have been working on them, so it's not like someone's toy code. Even these highly optimized mappers spend 50 to 70% of their runtime just waiting for the memory, virtually doing nothing. <laughs> and why is it so? The thing is, all of them rely on having a gigantic uh, genomic indices in the memory. <laughs> now, you just want to see is some camera in the index. However, you, when you issue the command, is this camera in the index, you know, actually processor, they have actually to ask memory to access this particular memory location. And if your index is really huge, which in genomic it always is, it takes some time to actually go to memory, to find this location, to return it back, and so on and so forth. And this is called stalling. Now you're just not doing any computation on the processor side, but just waiting for the memory to give you data. And God help you if your data is actually on a hard drive, so you actually have to, you know, it becomes even like 100 times slower. The question is, can we make this stalling less? Can we do something useful while we are waiting from memory. Because very often you can just say, you know, I need this, this, and this from memory, but while you get me something, <coughs> I can do something again useful. And in that case, I can reduce the amount of styling. And it is a possible, and that's exactly what prefetching is. It's basically just give a command, I want this and this and this in advance. And while the, you're getting the data from the memory, you do something again useful. 
Now, this is certainly doable in C, but this is extremely hard to implement in C. Uh, on the other hand, Seek supports dynamic prefetching for uh, queries very easily. Your goal is, the only thing you have to do is if you have your class, your index, you have to add a special prefetch magic, which will hand, handle the prefetching. Now for all internal types in Seek and lists and structs and whatever, we already implemented this hard part. So this you can just kind of, index is using list, you can just call our thing and there you go. It's very simple to implement prefetching. As, as, and this is if you're a library, how do you call? creator if you're just implementing some fancy index. As an end user of an index, <laughs> the way to activate prefetching is just by an function with the decorator prefetch code. Seek will actually convert this function, which is annotated prefetch, into the coroutine, which can be, what does that mean? <laughs> Whenever you try to access the index, Seek, will cement, prepare me the data, and then we'll suspend this coroutine. By suspending it, it can run some other coroutine or some other function at the same time. That's how you call doing some useful work while you're waiting for a memory. Once the memory is, uh, once your data from memory has arrived, it will suspend what it has been working on, bring back this suspended coroutine and keep going on. <laughs> now, this is really, um, why is this not more common? My people don't use it, for example, in C++ and Python, is that, for example, this simple pipeline has to be actually converted to gigantic state machine, which has to, how do you call, which is both state machine and scheduler, which has to keep track of the proteins and which has to suspend them, resume them, and so on and so forth. And if you want to kind of stack them together in multiple layers, this, you virtually have to reconstruct you restructure your whole code base to be able to support this thing. In Seek, that's one of the places where it's really useful to have a compiler. You don't have to worry about these things, you just add one thing and then compiler does this uh, thing automatically for you. <laughs> in this prefetching, we found out that it can get us up to 50% improvements in runtime. And speaking of the improvements, so all these things, what are they for? <laughs> we did run some benchmarks. <laughs> Python, we compare first everything about st against standard Python. <laughs> we first compare to be ag also so against some uh, just in time and Python compilers like Nuit, Kashetskin, and PyPy, which is the most popular. As you can see, compared to standard Python, we can do, just by using PyPy, we can speed up the stuff quite a lot. We, by the way, our benchmarks, uh, I forgot to mention that are actually a collection of um, three uh, programming language benchmarks which are related to bioinformatics that are public benchmarks and three of the benchmarks we actually designed uh, for how do you call uh, analyzing the hundreds of millions of reads so basically these are on a small data set these are on the gigantic data sets uh, some of them do reverse complementation uh, ch check how many uh, k-mers you have do you have cpg islands how many 16 mers or have and so on and so forth <laughs> so as you see even if you don't want to switch to C, at least can urge you to switch to PyPy. It really helps a lot. Now we also tested against Julia. We implemented this benchmark in Julia. Julia surprisingly is not that fast as we thought. It is fast in a couple of cases, faster than the rest. But in general, PyPy is kind of beating it. Plus you have to learn a new language. However, <laughs> Seek is completely different thing. So in Seek, we are able to get over 160x speedups over Python. Uh, in some cases, typically 40, 50, we are much faster than PyPy and everyone else. So to translate it a little bit in more practical terms, instead of waiting for four hours for your Python script to end up, you can do the same thing in Seek in one hour, 30 minutes. And the C code we used here is virtually the same as the Python code. <laughs> okay, it was easy kind of to beat Python, right? But how do we kind of stand versus C++, the, how would you call the kings of the speed? We compared uh, Seek, uh, uh, to CLang++ and G++. So CLang and G++ are very similar. They have a little bit different optimization strategies. So their performance, you know, is a bit different here and there, but generally they are similar. And this is by the Python. So as you can see, C is always much faster than Python. However, <laughs> Seek is either virtually the same as a, as a C++ or is able to even outperform C++. In one case, we were able to get 7x speedups over C++, which, which, is, which was something really surprising even for us. 
And we also did some benchmarks uh, on a genome index querying. So we basically used the genome indices from uh, SGA and SnapMapper. And we used the user code for, from G++ and CLang and C++ and C. By the way, the index itself has been implemented in C++. We haven't re-implemented index in C. We just implemented the querying code in C. So if you just keep using C++ index, and you know, write C code, you still get virtually the same performance as, um, or even better, up to 25% better improvements than C++. But if you use prefetching, one extra line in C, just one extra line from the user point of view, you can get up to 50% speed improvements over C++ Hojiko implementations. <laughs> and the final experiment, this is not really experiment, this was, this was actually a recent uh, result, we didn't actually publish in the paper. <laughs> is that we are recently trying to implement some in-house software uh, from MIT Combio Lab in Seek itself. And one of them was a Quora mapping software. <laughs> so Quora is a mapper, and the core idea of Quora is actually homology table generator. <laughs> so the previous guy who implemented Quora implemented this thing in C++. And it's roughly 1,400 lines of code, and it takes three plus hours to complete. It's really how Jucopra um, computational heavy process. It has to analyze the whole human genome and find all the homologous regions there and create some special tables. And by the way, this hasn't been done by someone who doesn't know C++. This was actually done by a person who is, I would call a C++ expert and who really understands what's going on like uh, with the com computers and who is able to uh, create a highly performant C++ software. So this was kind of state of the art when it comes to speed. So we took the same high level, and by the way, most of this code is a bunch of slow level manual optimization we had to do in C++ to make the runtime reasonable. Otherwise, it's even worse. However, in a seek, we rewrote the same thing. We just rewrote the high level idea. We didn't implement a single optimization ourselves. We ended up whole idea implementing in 126 lines, so 10 times smaller, much more maintainable, easier to use or something. And it actually runs in only 30 minutes, only six, six times faster. This is basically proof that in many cases, compiler can outperform human when it comes to these uh, low level optimizations, because most of them are quite uh, dull tasks when you're implementing it. So better, how would you call outsource dull stuff to computer compiler while you're dealing with something cooler, let's say like high level ideas, trying to, how would you go find something about cancer or maps, something or something like that. And that's pretty much about it. <laughs> to summarize, the Seek is a Python based language for computational genomics. So we try to kind of get together speed of C, ease, and expressness of Python. We have compile time, time checking, bunch of genomic optimizations, pipelining, and prefetching. Seek is also a general language. So it's easy to repurpose for other users. For example, currently, some people are trying to re implement to use seek to generate the data compression dsl you can use seek in a numerical computing in a bunch of other fields not only in the fields of bioinformatics <laughs> you also in future want to work on extend it so currently we are having like initial versions of seek there are a bunch of things we can work on for example we want to have a more more advanced pipeline optimizations like we want to have dynamic memory access and that alignment pattern detection during the runtime so you can automatically instruct processor what to do and how to align the memory. We want to integrate Seek with NextFlow and other running other pipeline frame frameworks and we want to be able to run Seek on cloud. We are currently working with uh, Google Cloud to actually hopefully we will be able to actually integrate Seek into their Hojiko products. <laughs> And um, we also want to actually add some special stuff to Seek. We want to add support for machine learning. And we are having a project here at ULIC. We are basically creating a secure compiler. So compiler which can take any code and compile it in a secure way so you can run it on mul secure multi-party, uh, how do you call it? Um, secure multi-party frameworks or something like that. And it supports secure sharing and something like that. And we're also working <coughs> For a language, <laughs> you actually need the support. So we are actually currently having some students working to add ID support, like support for Jupyter, for Visual Studio codes, to smooth out some language problems we have currently. We want to add some visualization capabilities, uh, interaction with R, and finally we would like people to use Seek, see how is it going, do they like it, do they know if they don't like, to let us know, so basically we can, how do you call it, improve it in however way we can. 
And that's about it. Finally, I'd just like to spend some time acknowledging people, mostly Arya Shaji from MIT. This, this project was virtually brainchild of his and without this guy, we would be nowhere how much work he has done. Uh, we also like to thank uh, Bonnie Berger at MIT and Riyadh and Saman Amara Singer from MIT Compiler Group who helped us write paper and uh, how you call provided lots of useful suggestions and people who tested Seek or using Seek and provided us a lot of suggestions like Hoon, Alexander, Lorenzo, William, Frederick and Tal. And uh, also would like to thank my students at Ulic, especially Jordan and Jody who work lots of Seek and implement a bunch of features which make the whole project state of the project much better and we can get Seek at this address and check development and read the paper here. Thank you so much and if you have any questions please let me know. Uh, thank you so much, Ibrahim, for your uh, great presentation. So uh, I guess if anybody has any questions, please uh, either use the raise hand function or ask the question in the chat uh, or mention that you do have a question in the chat. Uh, so we can give the floor for you to, can, to ask the question. Uh, I guess uh, maybe I can ask a question uh, which is, Towards the end, you've mentioned uh, like integrations with something like Jupyter. So that was one of the early things that I was thinking about when you were talking about Seek is, are there limitations uh, from the programming language design and it being strongly typed and a lot of compiling that would prevent you from doing this uh, very nice, especially during development or giving tutorials uh, what you can do in like IPython or Jupyter Notebooks where you write a small block, you can run it, and then whatever, whatever state you had in initial uh, cells, you can proceed forward with it. No, there's not. Actually, we already have a Jupyter implementation. It's just in beta. So the Jody, the student I, I mentioned, she actually did a lot of this implementation, but we are still kind of testing it because she has recently left. So I'm currently doing some tests internally and uh, because we're also recently doing some lots of changes to our compiler core internally. The latest, uh, that branch still hasn't caught up with the latest, how would you call, commit on the GitHub, but essentially the support is pretty much there and there's no technological obstacle to actually implementing it and making it even better, especially because LLVM, our kind of compiler framework, completely supports just-in-time compilation. So we can do it virtually the same thing as Python does or Julia does. Okay, uh, well, uh, we have a question from Faraz. Uh, so if you can unmute, yeah. Uh, thanks, Ibrahim. Actually, I have a few questions, not just one. Um, so let's just ask uh, number one. Um, so um, so you, you mentioned some place that the, the copying is an issue and we, we are completely aware of it. Uh, my, myself I, as a C coder and I, I've seen it very much how it affects the uh, performance. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're saying that when you have like uh, not going to be modifying the content, right? So you can actually, you don't really need to make a copy of the original yes. text. You can actually slice it. But when, whenever you say about the pointers, right? When when it's it's it's, it's a trade-off usually between um, the memory management at that point as well as your copying, right? So think about that. I, I need only like to keep former, right? And for former, you're going to make a pointer, which is going to probably use number of bytes. So uh, over and billions of let's say locations, this is going to cost. So here's the thing. So string it's themselves and the seek objects themselves are already pointers. So mm -hmm. internally they implemented, you have a like array and you have a length and the pointer to that like. <laughs> Cameras are not. Our camera types are actually highly specialized. So for example, former will be stored in a appropriate register. That's about it. <laughs> Eight more, even like a and we support up to, I think, 2048 MERS. They're actually virtually stored as a collection of registers without having anything else. Uh, so yes, we don't have a problem with the formers or stuff. Obviously, if you're just using string and creating uh, millions of pointers to single characters, yes, that's worse. And that's sadly something I don't think compiler really can help you that much there. <laughs> okay. 
maybe if you do some maybe deeper analysis uh, and if you kind of have a statically indicated that you're always using one byte characters or let's say four byte characters doing the slices on them, we can maybe figure out something like that. Our, our kind of the analysis engine is not yet that powerful, but it mostly tries to <laughs> handle the common cases. Let's say you have a genome and you just want some substring of a genome to check against your read, right? <laughs> you don't need to copy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or even suppose that you have a genome and you want to take a, sub, a reverse complement of that particular part of genome to check against your read because you're, when you're aligning, you're usually aligning versus genome and a reverse complement. So typically people will take copy and reverse complement. In our case, you don't, we don't do any copy at all. We just say, for us, reverse complement is a flag. And it automatically, if you take a slice, it knows it will start from the back and read this way and do automatic the stuff. So this kind of stuff, we can actually optimize quite a lot. I mean, as, again, you can do all of these things in C, but it's just painful, as you know yourself. Uh, so the second question is uh, with respect to your, uh, at some point you mentioned that you have a nested uh, parallelization. Yes. Um, I, I would like to hear a little bit more about that one, if, if you can, and how it works with actually with prefetching. So, Okay, uh, I, I myself haven't tested it yet with prefetching. Uh, I actually tested the nest parallelization myself a few weeks ago. So we were implementing this uh, phasing software and uh, it was original Python code. So actually, it, and one of the issues we had with actually passing through the reviewers was that um, speed wasn't that good. <laughs> It wasn't that bad, it wasn't that good. So I decided, let's, let's write it in Seek. It, Seek was stable exactly around the time we had this reviews and stuff. <laughs> and one of the things, obviously, I, I wanted to parallelize it. There were like two ways you can parallelize. First one, you can parallelize the algorithm itself. But the second thing, you know, because when you're phasing, you can consider every single chromosome separately. So you can parallelize both on algorithm level and on the chromosome level. So I just decided to stack them up together. It actually works uh, very well. The reason is because we are using, uh, we are using this LLVM taper. Taper is uh, another project actually from MIT for, uh, which does figure out the parallelism on the LLVM model and either relies on OpenMP or on Silk, Intel Silk library, depending what is your ending. So basically there are, what you just have to specify on the, uh, as a compiler, what are your parallel components, and then it will automatically generate those pragmas from OpenMP or how do you call, generate the silk code, and then it basically, those things will schedule it automatically for you. And that scheduler actually works, I was really surprised it works really well, especially because, at least for me, when I'm like coding in C, scheduling stuff is usually the hardest part. Okay. Uh, final question. I think this is more as a user. If I mm -hmm. if I have to switch to you, um, so the two things, right? Uh, selection of languages. Uh, we heavily rely on uh, C because there is always backward compatibility. Right? For many of yep. cases, we can actually up to, up, uh, you know change the compiler. It will compile our old code, right? Mm -hmm. um, so as a as a designer of a compiler uh, for the bioinformatics uh, or general more general language. Um, what should we expect? Uh, are we sh should we expect that when we open a bug with a compiler, should we see the real, like, uh, you know, uh, resolve of the issue within days, within months? Um, that's, that's the best question. And actually, I'll be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> that's the thing we are actually trying currently to solve. That's the problem with that issue is that we don't have a technical solutions for that. <laughs> uh, so, I'm actually looking for actually either pairing up with some other things or maybe launching a startup or non-profit or something like that. Basically, uh, we need someone to steward the language. So we don't want, to, you know, the moment uh, ARIA graduates or I move on my grant, which is covering this thing expires, we are like, okay, done. Everything is done. We are moving out, especially for programming languages because those things tend to stick. <laughs> so for that, we're actually currently exploring and looking at the venues, how we can actually make this thing more sustainable. Currently, we are having a, until recently, it was mostly two persons work. Currently, we're already having like six to 10 persons. We're having a, like an army of uh, Europe's and uh, undergrads and a couple of grad students already working on it. So it's now much better. I would definitely say how you would expect help now much faster. And we hope like in a, 
next uh, half year or year, we will actually get many more users. So we will actually able to respond to most of these issues as quick as possible. That's, I mean, that's definitely one of the things we want to handle it because that's kind of, if you don't handle this thing, your language is pretty much dead in the water, right? Thanks. Uh, I think we have a question uh, from the chat from Ihsan. Uh, so his question is, uh, have you compared Seek's performance with Rust and its bioinformatics library Rust Bio? No, uh, uh, okay, we haven't. I, I'll be honest, I just got to know about Rust Bio after we published the paper. However, um, I would expect their performance not to be any, um, any better than C, as far as I know Rust myself. And I checked that library uh, a little bit. Uh, I think it's going to be comparable to C. So I think uh, so. Both Rust and Seek and C C Lang use LLVM as a code generator, right? I mean, none of us have a runtime. So at the end of the time, um, raw performance uh, is kind of comparable. So even for C plus plus. So all these experiments I showed you for C plus plus, for example. Uh, where we were be better. So I have to add a kind of, there is a catch there. Uh, you can make C++ code be as fast as Seek uh, because at the end of the day, C++ is like one step removed from assembly, right, or C. Uh, so you can just force it to be, to use the same thing. But the, well, how we implemented this thing in C++ uses idiomatic C++ without having to think of optimization. So basically we wanted to compare, let's say 50 line C++ code to 30 line C code. We don't want to, compare 5 million line C++ code, which is as fast versus 30 lines uh, C code, right? So same thing I would say with Rust. The Rust is a general purpose, very general purpose language. So you can certainly make it work to be as same as C if you want to. Now, is it worth it? That's up to you. But uh, against particular library, we still haven't benchmarked it. We are planning probably to do it soon for our own purposes. Okay, so... Uh... I'm waiting to uh, see if there are any more questions. Uh, uh, and, but thank you so much, uh, Ibrahim. So just one last call for, for questions. If anybody has a question, please uh, raise your hand uh, or ask it in the chat. And I think Faraz has another question. So I'll give the floor uh, one more time for Faraz. Uh, thank you. So uh, I'll just uh, choose, uh, uh, take this opportunity to ask one more question. Uh, with, re with respect to the prefetching, um, I still have, I mean, the prefetching works very well if you definitely have um, instructions that can be done that, that's not dependent, like it's, it's not a serial uh, sequence of instructions to be completed, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a ser like serial sequence of instructions, uh, still, the only prefetching really going to happen is prefetching of the instructions, it's not going to be prefetching of data. So for prefetching, so here's the thing. Uh, prefetching, uh, there are a couple of things. Uh, so a full experiments we run, this one was by far the most finicky experiment. Uh, roughly, after you access the data, so here's the thing, if you're just accessing the data, let's say from table, and then immediately using that data after that, you have to wait. There's nothing you can do. <laughs> We're basically based on a simple, simple paper. That's basically the original idea, which we just re-implemented in our language. <laughs> uh, but if you very often you have, let's say, you, uh, you you load something from the thing, and then you have like a, like some gigantic how would you call called block under it. And then after that, you start using your thing. So in that case, prefetching is going to help you really a lot. <laughs> so the th here's the whole point. Will prefetching work for your application or not? I cannot tell you. In some cases, it works really well. In some cases, it doesn't work at all. In some cases, it might even slow down your program a little bit. So we've seen all these cases. But that's exactly the whole point why we have it on a compile level. So if you want to test does prefetching work or not in C++, you would have to spend good three, four days re-implementing this. In Seek, you just add one line, check. Does it work? Work. Awesome. Does it not, doesn't work? Doesn't work. Remove that one line, you're done. So that's the whole point, yeah. So in our experiments for SGA and snapping, this is prefetch work really well. There are a couple of cases, I'm sure prefetch doesn't work, and they also reported them in an original paper, for example, a couple of algorithms. If you're just using stuff too fast, it might even slow down your program. But you have basically to test it manually, and that's the whole point of the seek, like the sale point, you can test it in a second. 
Okay, thank you, Brian. Okay, uh, well, thank you, thank you so much, Brian, for this uh, great talk. And thank you for the invitation. Uh, yeah, well, hopefully we'll get to have you attend Vanbug in person uh, when we resume our in-person meetings. Uh, and thanks everybody for attending. Unfortunately, we cannot offer you pizzas and uh, have our in-person networking session. Uh, but uh, hopefully we'll get that another time. Uh, so thanks everybody. And uh, that will be all for uh, this month's uh, Vanbug. Thanks, Paul. Bye.